Boa, Boa tarde a todos do MOOC 2012. We will resume Gostaríamos de lembrar que os últimos convites para o jantar de encerramento do Congresso do MOOC 2012, que ocorre logo mais à noite, estão à venda na bilheteria que está localizada dentro do foyer do teatro. As inscrições para a caminhada cultural de amanhã podem ser feitas na mesma bilheteria do foyer. To uh, 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 inscribe yourself for the cultural path for tomorrow. Uh, Agora, it must be done in the foyer as well. We will now begin the parallel session number six with the title Strategies for Collecting and Assessing Results in Sports Projects. We call now Ana Cristina, the moderator from UNESCO Brazil and speakers Nilceia Lopes from Instituto Ayrton Senna Brazil, Rejane Pena Rodrigues of Public Authority for Olympics in Brazil, and Damien Hatton, Ackman Social Technologies from the United Kingdom. We now pass the floor to the moderator, Ana Cristina Azevedo Nascimento. Hello, good, good day. Good day to everyone. Good afternoon, excuse me. It's a pleasure to be here with you to discuss such an interesting thing in the sports area, which is the uh, uh, strategies for collecting and assessing results in sports projects. We have a ambitious goal today with this panel, which is to answer a question that I am very curious to see if we can reach a concrete answer, which is how to evaluate the effectiveness of projects and certify that they uh, ensure a social change and participation from the community and their people. We have the issue of evaluation and in sports development and projects uh, from my perspective, I think it's even more challenging, it's more recent, this effort for uh, assessing impact, for assessing the contribution of projects, there's a lot to be done still. I think we will see very good cases here, and I hope we can contribute for this discussion today. Uh, from these uh, initiatives, we have the goal of discussing and aligning basis for a systematic for collecting results and assessing uh, projects for sports for all. So it doesn't make sense for me to talk too much here. We want to listen to our speakers. So let us begin with Nisea Lopes from Ayrton Senna Institute. Nisea is a person that will surely contribute. She has a lot of experience in projects and development in general for sports. She is now a manager in uh, Ayrton Senna uh, with the state of Pernambuco, leader of the program for sports from Brazil, master's in history, specialization in apprenticeship from be acted for 30 years as a public teacher and as assessor in the pedagogical ever. Coordinated several working groups for technical documents, implementation for programs, and defining strategies. And, and since 1996, integrates collaboration in, Insti in Ayrton Senna Institute. Nisaya, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here today to sharing with you a trajectory of Institute uh, Ayrton Senna in the sports area and education through sports. And actually, I am a speaker for a group, uh, a working group that produced uh, significant knowledge. And this crew, I, I am part of this uh, team very recently, and I hope to pass along the what has been done uh, along this time in the institution. The program that we have been developing since 1996, which is education through sports, what we're trying to bring are the results and the impacts uh, on the development of the 
apprentice. It's always important for us to say we're not talking about a, pro, a sports program. We're talking about a, a program for spo education through sports. How much sports is a path for the development of cognitive competencies and uh, how much it is a privileged path for human development, for the development of children and youngsters. So this is our main focus from the Institute since 1996. I would like to say that if I could say where the DNA of the Institute lies, I would say that the DNA of their actions is in management and, of course, through assessment. No one that manages uh, committed with results, no one who, can, who wants to manage in any organization, he cannot uh, go without uh, assessment in a management process. So I'm going to unite where the nucleus the strong nucleus of the work of this institute, which is management and assessment. So any concept, any solution that the institute develops or constructs or designs uh, goes from this assessment. How do we define the focus for a educational solution? This focus is defined by a context evaluation, a demand evaluation, and priority evaluation. This defines the focus. How do we build the solution? Through indicators, clear indicators, and precise indicators, goals, trajectories for what you want to reach. So the design... The design for a uh, educational solution is always built up through uh, strategies, goals, and indicators, the process indicators and product indicators as well. In the definition for implement, implementing a educational solution is also the assessment as an access for uh, you have to analyze the scenario, the local scenario, with the potential and limitations, the advantages and disadvantages, risks, threats, so that we can make viable the implementation of an educational solution. The result are as well. Uh, the, all the work has to generate results. I, th I think it's interesting in, in, in our institute, we are committed to that the, our actions generate results, that our actions make evidence how far or how near we are from the uh, intended goal. We know that sometimes there is an activity form the third sector, and we lose a bit this dimensioning for the assessment of results and impacts. The monitoring, uh, all the process of monitoring is done uh, uh, depending on how close or how far we are. We are following this step by step. This goes for all educational solutions from the institute. Uh, W from a formal curriculum or complementary uh, actions. This is the design of the process that the Institute has defined until we can reach through the consolidated results to the dissemination and mobilization for this, these projects. Uh, being, that being said, I would like to comment that the Institute Ayrton Senna also brings within its axis, within its core work, the four pillars for uh, human development that come from the Jacques Delors uh, report from UNESCO and for the paradigm for the human development, Amart Sen. These are uh, the references with which the Institute works in its proposal for s educational solutions. In this dimension, 
And this goes for any educational solution, but also for this program for uh, education through sports. What the Institute uh, seeks to do is what were the com competencies from personal P personal characteristics that can be developed through this solutions in terms of identity and self-knowledge, self-esteem, uh, and a vision, a confident view of the future. As a, how much can an educational solution can promote this? And uh, we suppose that sports is a privileged path for the enhancement of these. Um, uh, also in terms of resilience and self-esteem, and that is a, a, another dimension. Also, we, in our design of our proposal, how much we can create and develop uh, competencies and recognizing your next, the interaction amongst people, also in the era for interpersonal and a, um, okay, a cognitive competencies and productive competencies. When we do this mapping, this, this designing of the macro where, of where we want to get, we search for what, how much sports is a privileged path to develop these human competencies inherit for what is expected of a citizen from the first 21st century. I'm going to deal with our trajectory, uh, le dealing with uh, these assessments and human development. I'm going to deal a little bit uh, uh, with our work in a trajectory, what has been done in assessment and within the program, education through sports. The institute was created in 1994 to, to 1995 in the context right after Ayrton Senna's death. And the institute was born uh, almost together with the program. It couldn't be different. The vocation of the institute due to its leader, Ayrton Senna, the program uh, was born together with the Institute and also uh, adding the production nucleuses of knowledge that the university um, uh, translated and were already building. So we have six partner universities that add and make a community, act as a community to think about a program of education through sports that intends to develop human competencies. These are the first universities. Uh, some are here, present here. Some are in this forum and sharing their knowledge, and in a certain way, I am a speaker of this knowledge, and this community designed the program Education Through Sports. The Institute has as a view the uh, development of children's potential, and the program from its beginning, this was evident Uh, uh, I'll, I'll take this time to tell you, uh, sometimes it's very common for us to develop a solution to, to make, uh, to confront a problem. And what we perceive in the uh, program Education Through Sports, the goal was not to oppose a problem or to face problem, it was to create a proposition. We weren't developing a program educa for education through, through sports for an issue of health or violence or any other area. We're creating a program f because we believe that sports it was 
uh, is able to develop talents, competencies inherent to the demand of our century. Well, are we there yet? Are here. Uh, following 1996, when we began our work with these universities, building a design of what is this project and a, an action of what this project is, and the origin is at USP for several reasons. Uh, due to its prox physical proximity and Ayrton having a relationship with this team, with, this, with these people. And in 1998, the Institute uh, thought that we had to generate uh, um, results. We launched a manual, and this was uh, uh, something pioneered because social projects began to be viewed as uh, necessarily having to show results from their actions. And the ideal of the program and the conceptual basis is made, and this basis will serve f uh, for the indicators of assessment that I will present now to you. The assessment question that we had in 2000, we began this in 1996, and after four years of developing the project, the assessment question was, at up to what point does the program uh, help the development of competencies for children uh, in school and in life? The assessment was made th by two external consultants. Uh, the work was integrated by the units, which were the consultants and the universities. The universe of the children was for 3,000 uh, youngsters from 7 to 13 years old, and this sample uh, was for 338 students. We also had a control group because every Every assessment, the whole assessment was made to see how the intentional action of sports through the development of competencies was reaching its goal. So our control team, our control group, were youngsters with less than 12 years uh, within the project. So the instruments that were used were a combination of goals, interviews, questionnaires, observation, direct observation, uh, consulting documents. We had answers from parents, teachers, and educators, and the, all the work was done in this triangular way for inconsistencies, inconsistencies in these answers that were given. This was back in 2000. The result that we got from this assessment in 2000, this, in this six universities, is that the educators with over 12 months were three times, had three times more possibilities to present a better result. So a year of work planned with the, with a consistent methodology, with a intended goal, has a, a threefold impact uh, on those who haven't passed through this approach. What we saw in that assessment was that the students that participated in the project, and it was a project on the uh, uh, after hours, they had 96% of approval when the mean approval, the average approval was 81.3% on their schools, and dropout rate as well. There was less dropout in schools than their colleagues from uh, in the same school. So the the action of uh, sports uh, towards uh, social competencies, cognitive and productive uh, competencies has a differentiation from the school projects and, the, uh, and their own life projects. The data we have here, uh, the yellow bar refers to kids that were in the program for less 
than one ear, and the other bar, the green one, are the ones who have been in the program for a longer time. We can see uh, self-control, autonomy, self-confidence, and self-determination within the personal competencies. Within the relationship competencies, we can see co-education, cooperation, sociability, rights, and duties. Uh, we can see here the difference between the bars. You can see that if students are there for a longer period of time, there is an impact on kids and teenagers in terms of cognitive skills. We can see the reading, writing, oral ability or skill and resolution of problems. We can see here that what a systemized, uh, intentional action and an action geared at competencies can have a good result through sports. And the same with productive competencies, uh, work group, self-management, creativity, and initiative. Here we can see a higher impact and the leadership of youngsters and teenagers. This assessment was done in the year 2000, four years after the project was initiated. Then, after we came to see that the project had good results, it was time for us to disseminate this knowledge that was produced and that was validated. And here you have a technical training with which we increased the number of partners in the university. And from 1996 to 2011, you have uh, uh, 12 states, 14 universities, 37 municipalities, over 90,000 kids and youngsters being served with this methodology. This assessment is very important for us because it consolidates and not only the child that we had focus in the first place, but also our work methodology, because this belief has to be made concrete by a methodological, educational, and planned work. What for us is important to even uh, further or beyond believing on what we're doing is to take the right path in that direction. Because of this knowledge that we acquired, the Ayrton Senna Institute received this uh, seal from UNESCO by its work. We have published a book called Program Evaluation, Concepts and Practices, and another book called Education for the Human Development by Sports. We can see that this book is used by educators, sports people, and teachers all over Brazil, because it brings this four-year path that we had and the assumptions that we had for us throughout this time. In 2005, uh, Ayrton Senna Institute carried out an international congress, and the aim of this congress was to share theoretical bases that support the idea as a privileged path for human development. In this seminar, many experts from several parts of the world brought their expertise and shared their works to show exactly what it is public domain today, the public and theoretical basis for the work we had been doing in 2006, we did another assessment of the project. And this time, it was not restricted only on the program knowledge through sports. We wanted to assess everything that we were offering as extra activities. We focus on formal education and extra work, extra education or extracurriculum education. We wanted to see the impact the uh, 
all the impact it had on all competencies. The comparison between these two groups of children with the same parameter, 12 years on the action of the project and less than 12 years old, brought some results to us that I want to share with you today. This specifically on sports. Children with less than one year in sports had an impact on their personal competencies of 67%. When they were over one year in sports, this margin goes up. Uh, the relationship uh, competencies, cognitive and productive competencies also go up. This uh, means that the the path was very clear, and we only needed to consolidate and disseminate it. The impact we had on school approvals, uh, we had 94.4%. The average of schools was 78%. So what does it say to us? It tells us that we have to work with the cognitive competencies of children and youngsters. But if we do not invest on non-cognitive competencies, we will never be able to change the move towards this society that the 21st century demands us. From 2007 onwards, we have a smaller group. Here you can see the rates of approval here in this bar. I would like to tell you where we are today. The project Education Through Sports is continuing now with a partnership with the university, a technical partnership to consolidate methodologies to enhance knowledge. The institute today challenges itself to take this knowledge and replicate it in scale. The mission of the Ayrton Senna Institute today is to build and multiply knowledge in scale so that human development is generated. In that sense, the Education Through Sports project, the way it is configured today, serving a small group of children and youngsters within universities, showed us that it is possible to do that, but we need to gain scales. Our two major challenges today are, first, to advance on the reflections that all projects brought to us today of cognitive and non-cognitive competencies. Today, the Institute has macro competencies matrix that the 21st century demands. We are doing, for that reason, several seminars to see how to unfold these macro competencies in the operation of each one of the of our projects. This is the, uh, the challenge that we have, which is a great challenge. We are thus having some partnerships with local and international institutions. Another challenge that we have is to take the knowledge we have to translate it into scale using schools, how to reach all students, how to have all students benefiting of an educational sportish action that can generate this kind of skill and competencies development. Today, our internal design is to think about this knowledge within the curriculum dimension of physical education. This does not mean just translating documents, but to create a new working culture in a way that more children and youngsters can take advantage of this knowledge. This is our two main challenges today. And I would say that the 
Our motto is that much more than approvals, what we're seeking through this evaluation is the consolidation of a culture of permanent and systematic reflections about the concepts and practices adopted adopted for the development of human potentiality. The adoption of these practices is the core of what we're doing, of doing more, of adding, of building. More than having right and complete answers, we have questions. And these questions are, what are the competencies that is demanded by our century today, and how do we reach a larger universe for children and youngsters? We want to make an impact on their lives still today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nisea, for your presentation. I think it was very rich to see what you have been able to achieve and the challenges that you propose to you. The competencies for the 21st century, I believe, is something common for all the entities that work. They're all trying to define what they are. Ayrton Senna Institute plays a very important role as a leader, one of the leader organizations by the size of uh, serving, the size of the and the number of people they serve. And it's good to see that the Institute is working towards that end together with your partners. Thank you very much. Now we're going to uh, listen to uh, Rejani Pena Rodriguez. She is an uh, Olympic public authority. She is a professor in physical education uh, focused on leisure studies and manager of the area. She's a superintendent in the Directory of uh, Operations and Services of the Olympic Public Authority in Rio de Janeiro. She acted as a secretary at the Ministry of Sports. Uh, you have the floor, Regiane. We have 20 minutes for your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and to participate in this panel. This event brings new concepts to light in terms of sports and leisure activities. At this time, Brazil needs to reflect a lot upon this topic uh, as we have our mega events approaching the World Cup, Soccer Cup, and the Olympic Games. I'm going to try to explain what what is the Pub Olympic Public Authority. Perhaps you have not heard of this institution, which is an entity, not an institution. When Brazil was chosen to host Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2016, we wanted to have an interfederative consortium that integrated the city of the Rio de Janeiro, the state of Rio de Janeiro, and the federal government to guarantee and ensure everything would uh, go right. So today we are a management entity of this integration and approximation of the interfaces that are being done in different areas from energy to public security. We have this uh, local entity, which is LOCOG 2016. This is a great challenge we have had. That is why we need a partnership with the civil society. I believe the educational legacy will be really the most important uh, thing that we can uh, leave to the city and to the country. I'm here to uh, get to know about the experiences you have in that sense and also put together the APR expertise and the expertise of our other people and thus leave a positive legacy to everyone. 
So the, the Olympic Public Authority is here more as an entity to listen to what you have to say and to uh, what has been discussed here. I believe this will probably uh, and will surely, sorry, guide us in the future. I chose this quotation from a book that was taken from a book called uh, Assessment Policies by Eldir and Azayami Linhares, who uh, wrote this book. As a phenomenon of the modern world, sports and leisure came to be part of the life in the cities as they compose typical urbanization projects of industrialized societies and mass societies. They are productions of this context, contributing at the same time to produce a new cultural order, new identities and habits for cities and citizens. According to my experience as manager, which started in Porto Alegre in 1993 with the creation of the Municipal Secretariat of Sports and Leisure. This local focus, this territory and the city of Porto Alegre, this is something that calls my attention. Even going through the federal government and now belonging to a public Olympic authority, I, can, I have to have to know where this uh, games are happening. Uh, I know that uh, Regina Alves, uh, this uh, professor of mine, she liked to tell stories, and I believe through stories you can, uh, through stories and images, you can give an overview of, of the general picture. And in 1993, in Rio Grande do Sul, and I'm not telling here about Brazil, there were very few public entities in the local level responsible for sports and leisure. There were the sports municipal councils that prepared teams to uh, for intermunicipal games, but there was no policies for recreation and leisure in the case of Porto Alegre, because it was one of the places where the leisure activities started in Brazil. Like, for example, there were uh, basketball for public squares where uh, coaches uh, taught in public squares, but that was not, uh, did not happen throughout the state. Even the Secretariat of Sports always had this educational focus, I have to mention that. The structure of the school is very absorbing and leaves little space for discussion and the prioritization of policies outside school. At 1993, that was the reality. So perhaps we have people from this area working. That the responsibility used to lie on the public authorities, and that meant uh, uh, one political party that was in the government at that time. So uh, the policies were not consolidated. They did not consolidate upon the needs of sports and leisure. So I called the, them attention, saying that there were examples that worked very well, like SESC and SESI. Uh, there were in Brazil this kind of entities, but not as a public policy. So uh, we did not have this public policy, and it was difficult to evaluate actions that came from the public powers. So in the past 20 years, I have seen a very a wonderful evolution in this sense. A lot has been learned with these uh, institutions like SESC and SESI, which have all these activities structured. What are the points that core our attention when we talk about assessment? 
first uh, research in the area of sports and leisure that was very recent. So depending on the approach, it produces different results. Because we did not have indicators for public policies, even nationwide, Debra is here and she participated with us at the ministry, and she knows that. It was very difficult to know whether the policies were effective or not. If, in fact, we had a Brazilian policy or it was just a policy focused uh, locally, as you all probably know, sports and leisure are a uh, right of the citizen, but not a duty of the state. Uh, people got together to uh, turn sports and leisure a state priority together with uh, health and security so that funds would be guided to sports and leisure. There is uh, political will in that sense. Many states and municipalities have uh, struggled to have the funds, but still not even with the creation of the uh, the state system for sport, these funds are not available totally. Uh, and also at that time, we had another problem. I'm going to tell you an experience we went through. But before that, I'm going to just finish up this slide. What was the difference between the evaluation of a participative uh, project? Well, in this case, we involved all entities. Uh, a national public policy would have to uh, encompass teachers, coaches, uh, students, everyone. Uh, as government, we could not uh, focus in just one area, one specific area. Now, we wanted a policy that would respond to the needs whether the, the main goals would be targeted. In the systemized way, we had to know what we had to do. In this matter, we had the uh, invaluable participation of the Ministry of Sport and the Ministry of Science and Technology. And the Ministry of Science and Technology fostered research in the area of sports and leisure, focused on recreation. It does not have to do with educational or high-performance sports. It was an area that uh, the Constitution uh, states. We had the participation of over 50 universities of all types of research. Uh, ethnicities, see, uh, we worked with the Indian groups, uh, public policies, and we came to the now famous assessment of public policies. Sometimes governments have some difficulty of self-assessing uh, because answers can be biased. So what did we do? We have uh, this call for bid to foster those uh, types of research. And usually, these people come from outside of the Secretariat, National SES in FINEP, in other words, uh, different entities took part, uh, university professors that were not taking part in the bid. So it was not biased, uh, so to speak. One of the proposals that we had and was approved was to have a research, two programs, the Segundo Tempo and Sports for the City and Leisure. We were happy and concerned at the same time because actually Brazil has a very accentuated difference region by region. The program that is established in a certain area sometimes leads to completely different results than other areas. So. We had some results from Puki Minas University, Puki from Minas Gerais, that gave us the um, results of this research that was the system 
of uh, monitoring uh, the systems. They had they conducted this uh, research for over uh, two years in the case of our program, 756 interviews with the beneficiaries of the program of this sample, 82.6% were the users of the program, and in the case of some smaller children, were uh, their responsibility. So it was the characterization of beneficiaries was from 5 to 60 years old. They made up our, the groups of our participation, and several questions were asked. It was interesting to know who uh, the people who use the program were and the uh, traits of beneficiaries, uh, income, uh, the existence or use of equipment of leisure and sports where the program was implemented, the existence or participation in the program, what activities that were identified among beneficiaries that uh, encompassed uh, all sorts of sports and also courses that were not uh, in the sports area but leisure. In other words, this brought to the public policy program a design of what we had been doing in fact. And through this, we were able to change a little bit our route and the confirmation that we had worked on and planned to be the motto of the program was understood and accepted. So uh, you can see here in this slide, which has to do with uh, yesterday's uh, discussion. Evaluation is a process guided to determine uh, systematically and objectively the pertinence, efficiency, efficacy, and efficiency, which is the capacity to generate impact or to produce uh, positive differences in a certain context in a permanent way in all activities developed. And I took this definition because it was the one that the United Nations uh, has and uses. And I thought it was interesting because Professor Anderson said yesterday that he had this concern and questioned himself, if I understood rightly, when you go for funds to finance sports and leisure, if the way to present the project, the marketing of the project, it will make a difference when you presented the project. And this way, you could, you could bring the same inequality that exists in society itself when those who have uh, more funds to invest will have better results when they go after funding. And sometimes I, I think about that, but I also think about solutions. What we saw in two uh, points at the Ministry of Sports is that education is also important for those who create programs. So in the games for Indian uh, the Indian population, we had a lot of difficulty because according to the Indian culture, they do not write and they are now have Indians who are lawyers and professors, but at that time we didn't want to systemize their products so that they would get the verb, uh, the funds, because this would uh, decharacterize the project. We wanted also to learn about it with the red tape and bureaucracy, uh, there was a big resistance on their part. They wanted us to feel that they were different. And I remember talking to Hejani and, said, well, and they said, well, you have to understand that we are Indians, we're different from everyone, and you have to understand that, it is that the money is not from the Indians, the money is from the white people. So what did we do? We took some uh, we asked some uh, 
professors of the Secretariat and, and, and place them in the board of the Indian uh, Commission to create the project. So we didn't do the project for them, but we just presented. And regarding parliamentary uh, amendments, we did the same thing. We presented a kind of manual of how to fill up or fill out an amendment so that uh, social projects could be maintained in this uh, this manual, we took this manual to them and explained how it worked. I believe education, monitoring, and follow-up, assessment, reflection, theory, and practice go hand in hand. From our part, just to wrap up, uh, I'm sorry, I have uh, divested. Uh, well, I have to say that we need to have surveys and research that contribute to the growth of the country be it uh, academic research or surveys carried out by other institutions. We have to see where the opportunities are. We have to mobilize the participation of everyone to read the limits and see how far we can go, because there are limits on the programs, and the planning, monitoring, assessment. But if we identify these limits, we will probably have alternatives to go over and exceed. So we hope to contribute in this cause, which is the dissemination of conquests and achievements of sports and leisure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hejani. I think for me it was very interesting in both the both aspects of your presentation to know that there is a public authority for the Olympics and this is our expectations uh, that we uh, can have very positive re results. We will have a legacy and this was very positive. Uh, this knowledge was very helpful and the issue of uh, the assessment of uh, the second half, I think this has great impact nationally, so this was very interesting uh, to hear your contribution. Now, uh, before uh, I introduce our next speaker, for those who have questions for the two first speakers, you can send these questions. People are picking up these questions and just raise your hand and your uh, little block you have a form that you can fill in with your questions and they will be collected and brought up to me so now our last speaker last but not least which is Damien Hatton He's from Augment Social Technology from the United Kingdom and a social entrepreneur, uh, founded and developed um, as well as other social enterprises, including Augment Social Technologies. He has a great uh, academic curriculum and as a doctor has great experience in public health, has combined knowledge and experience to develop the InFocus, a solution for monitoring and assessment assessment adopted through by organizations of the social sector that need a simple solution to measure and evaluate its social impact. Let's now hear Damien. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's a very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me uh, along to this brilliant two-day event. Uh, it's been enlightening. and. Great to hear from the, my two panel colleagues as well on their various projects. Um, I apologize for my lack of Portuguese. Um, and I realize we're about 20 minutes from lunch, so <laughs> we've just not got to hang on for too much longer now. Uh, so I'll try and keep this relatively brief. Um, so what I'm going to just talk through over the next 15 minutes um, is a little bit about why we've developed this project and the partnership behind this project um, and some of the challenges, experiences, observations um, over the course of trying to implement this project uh, in various different continents uh, across the world. Um, 
and also uh, then just touch a little bit about the service itself, but really just the experiences behind it is, is what I'm going to focus upon. Um, so, initially, why, why are we doing this project? Um, well, we've heard over the last few days that impact measurement in this area of sport for development or sport for all is a crucial component moving forwards now. We've had a conversation for a long time, many years in this sector, if we call it a sector, um, about how good or bad sport for development is at... Closer to the maximum. How good or bad... This, ah, that makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> how good or bad this pro, uh, sport for development is at um, creating change in people's lives. Um, and we have to move the conversation on to results now. And I, I think that's pretty categorical now that um, measurement of results and working around results is, is crucial if the work that we all do every day um, is going to thrive into the future. We live in a world now that is accountable um, and where all spending needs to be better accounted for. So our, our case needs to be stronger. So this was one of the big driving forces you know, behind the InFocus partnership, which consists of three organizations, Acumen, um, which is the organization that I founded six years ago um, and I'm from and, and run that organization. Laureus Sport for Good Foundation, who you've heard of and from yesterday. Um, and Street Football World, one of the uh, organizing uh, partners of, of this event. Um, and this is kind of the global spread of organizations that we've been working with through this partnership over the last 12 months and uh, I'll talk you through some of the, the history of the partnership. Um, but what we realize, what all these organizations have realized is that there's a need uh, to support organizations, charities, NGOs on the ground to make this work of monitoring and evaluation, impact measurement more accessible. Um, so that people can implement the right tools at the right time so that the dependencies that Laureus has on information flow to them to understand how their investments are being made and likewise for Street Football World to understand how their investments are, are helping. Um, it's crucial to empower organizations on the ground um, with the right tools. So, where we, have, uh, where we are in the sort of story so far in the project, uh, it began in 2008 and with very much a research and developmental phase to really explore what are the barriers and challenges that organizations are encountering in trying to be more accountable for their results. Um, and this was a, a piece of work that was funded by FIFA uh, as part of their Football for Hope movement. Um, and the results of that were, were taken forward then into uh, the development of various tools and resources and technologies to help support organizations. Implementation began in 2010 with a project in the UK called Street League, which is a, an organization, a sport for development organization working with disadvantaged young people in, in, uh, in several cities across the UK, using sport as a tool to, to change their lives. Um, from 2011, we ro then began rolling out these tools to a lot of other projects within India, within Africa and the US, who were predominantly either members of the Street Football World Network or grantees uh, of Laureus. Um, and that really brings us up to where we are in terms of the moment, in terms of continuing to learn from these experiences with these projects and roll out uh, the resources and tools to other organizations um, 
with a particular focus now moving into South America and, and, and Brazil. Um, so over that period, that timeline which we just talked about, um, there's various sort of learnings and lessons that we've observed which, which uh, just thought we'd bring to light. Um, uh, responsibility upon them to measure their outcomes and measure their impact. Um, whereas, you know, perhaps from funding from trust and foundation sources, there is less stringent requirements for measurement. And this makes a big difference in terms of whether charities are actually measuring anything or not. Um, and it's pretty clear that there's at least 25% of charities who measure nothing. Um, there's also a 75% who do measure, so it's, it's not all bad news. Um, so funders clearly exert an influence on, on this area of, uh, of work, um, not least because majority of the projects that we work with and encounter will, cite the, will, will say that the main reason they don't do this, measure their impact, is because of the cost or the money involved in doing it. Um, so certainly funders making available resources to charities to invest in this particular area of work is a critical leadership role for funders to take um, because this does take an investment, it's an area that requires investment. There's also the distinctions and dependencies between these three things are not well understood, we've found. Uh, between monitoring, which is the very regular collection of information, usually led by staff internally within an organization, use, using indicators to see how they're progressing towards their goals, and evaluation, which is uh, the more one-off judgments that are then made from that information, and then research that, the, that is, is, is more for the broader uh, understanding of how these lessons can be applied across the whole field. And these terms are very used interchangeably within charities. And um, it, it's important that we you, know, we know what we're dealing with at any one moment in time. And what we've found is that the big missing piece to enable all these three things to work well is to first of all charities to have good monitoring practices um, within their organizations in place and the tools for their staff to really understand why they're collecting information and how to use that information um, to measure their progress towards the objectives that they set themselves on a, uh, an annual basis. Um, some of the reasons why this doesn't happen is because this field has been predominantly led by researchers who come in at the other end of the spectrum, which is research. And many organizations experience researchers coming in and doing one-off activities that don't leave the capacity behind for the organizations to uh, continue this work on a, on a long-term basis. Um, so we very much focus this service around supporting organizations with developing their monitoring capabilities and really focusing on internal staff and the processes around them. So in line with that, we've also noticed there's a, a pretty much a widespread lack of program theory out there. Um, a lot of organizations don't articulate well what they're trying to achieve. Um, in a way that is well documented or well described to be able to become a good framework for measurement. Um, there's a lack of m and &E expertise within charities on the ground um, to really understand and make this work accessible. People have to know why they're doing it and what the purpose behind it is and have simple tools to do these things. A lot of data is being collected, but not necessarily used. Um, organizations tend to collect masses of data, in my experience, um, 
but not do much with it um, in terms of turning it into learnings lessons. Um, not duplicating efforts and not starting from scratch or starting um, without taking into account what an organization already has in place is, is something that a lot of organizations um, are fearful of entering into this is that, that there will be duplication of efforts. And there's a need and desire out there to share learnings and work together, certainly across related fields and for organizations to work together. So, so this is a collection of sort of thoughts, if you like, from the work that we've done um, in terms of what is the current sort of landscape um, within monitoring and evaluation within sport for development projects. And these are some of the observations. Um, I'll skip through these slides uh, and talk a little bit more about the, the actual solution in response to that. Um, so in focus was developed and consists of two things, training and support on the one hand and software and technology to help with the management of that data in a more efficient way. Many organizations use spreadsheets and these can become very complicated over time. Um, also an important component of the response to these needs has been to look at developing some quality standards that relate to this area of work. So we identified eight areas and, and uh, that are interrelated to monitoring and evaluation um, so that there can start to be some consistency in how organizations address uh, this important issue of measuring their own impact. I'll just go into one of those standards in more detail so you get the idea behind the standards. Um, but theory of change is basically uh, an organization understanding what what the theory is behind how change happens for that organization, whether it's trying to achieve social, uh, health objectives, um, crime, all the various different elements. Um, so how do the activities of the organization create that change? And what is the pathway of change um, that an organization expects? So within this particular area, um, we have identified six standards, six good criteria that, that make up a good theory of change for an organization. And these are cross-referenced against lots of other quality standards that exist out there. But these are the first independently validated standards for, monitor for this particular area, monitoring and evaluation. So, likewise, monitoring uh, alignment whereby we try to create an alignment between the theory and the practice. Um, the role of indicators, again quality standards around setting of indicators and the use of indica indicators. Data collection and how data is, um, is brought into the organization and the training are required to, 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 to gather information how to manage the information well so that reports can be produced and used at the right time throughout the year. How that information that can then be channeled into, into learning and improvement for the organization, which is really one of the key reasons to, to actually do monitoring and evaluation, even though some of the, the motivations for this may start from wanting to just satisfy funders as is often the case that we've experienced, but it, the greatest benefits tend to come for organizations through learning and improvement. Reporting and accountability, and then the overall coordination of, of monitoring and evaluation efforts, so that when new requirements arise within an organization, whether it's a new funder um, driving that requirement, there's a process for managing change and managing the changing requirements there. So how we provide access to this service has also been very important in terms of you know, addressing some of those um, challenges that, that organizations face and really understanding an organization's starting point. Uh, and we use an assessment and diagnostic set of tools 
um, that measure their current status against the quality standards. Um, to really get a picture of where support is best deployed so that we don't duplicate any efforts but we build from where an organization is. That then leads naturally on to a process of implementation of supporting the organization through the process of, of putting in place all the necessary tools and that's split into training and support of two types. One is very one-to-one -one support for organizations and then the other is webinar-based training, which takes, takes place over a 10-week period. And this is just a, a low-cost way of being able to upskill many organizations. We often have 10 or 15 organizations on a single webinar, and it's a very low-cost way of, of, of raising the standards. And then ongoing support is, is, is usually figured out as a process during an implementation. So this is a kind of a, a process that we take organizations through. And am I doing it time? Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes, good. So finally, just a, a, a few, a quick look at some of the tools and resources that are involved in, um, in InFocus. Um, uh, now this may look very complicated, but this is a kind of an example of a, of a theory of change. Um, which is really a, a more realistic roadmap of how change actually happens for an organization. And some people will look at this and be horrified at, as how complicated it looks. Um, but unfortunately, social change, social development work is complicated and has lots of factors involved with it. And so getting a realistic picture of how change happens on the ground and a consensus around that is an important starting point within an organization um, for being able to one, create a good strategy to implement and, and use the resources well within that organization. But on the other hand, from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, it becomes a framework to really know what are the most important things to measure. And, and really differentiating what's important and what's not in data collection is, is important in itself. Um, so there are a bunch of other tools and resources um, which are outputs, if you like, from these kind of exercises. This is this, just a snapshot of the, of the software which has lots of different functionalities to be able to store participant information, um, program and session and activity information, surveys, etc., and, and consolidate information in one place. Um, and uh, it, this, the effort that we've tried to do is try to boil all of this down to simple tools that are very visual and very easy for organizations to utilize in the end and try to take some of the mystery around monitoring and evaluation out of the, out of the equation for, for organizations. Um, and ultimately, this final slide just shows, you know, the learning curves that need to be, end, you know, what do, we, what do organizations do with that information beyond just reporting to donors? Um, and this is a really important piece is, how do organizations use their data to actually learn and improve? And, and explore ideas for how to improve their projects. And this is probably the greatest benefit that we can expect out of this, this work. Um, so my only word of Portuguese in the whole presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Damien, for this great presentation. Um, it was really great to see that we have a tool that can be used to help us with monitoring and evaluation and uh, simplify it and demystify it because, as you said, uh, not everybody has a clear idea what is really the difference between monitoring and evaluation and the use of the information that's generated. So great that you're already working towards that. It will be very beneficial for all of us.
And now we finish our third uh, speech. Now we're going to start the Q&A session. Well, according to my perception, I believe that we had very brilliant presentation. They complemented each other. And I believe we have many interesting uh, discussions to have. So those who have questions, please continue uh, filling out the forms because we're still taking questions. Now I'm going to start with a question that was, well, actually there are two questions that were directed to Nilsea. But obviously, if the other guest speakers want to complement or answer, they are welcome. One came without the name of the person. But the question is, sports by itself is not able to generate too many changes in children. The role of educators are really important. Do you assess the performance of educators? What are the results? The other question uh, seeks to uh, work with educators' uh, work. Uh, it was done by the Bon Jesus NGO. They ask how to create evaluation strategies to em enhance the third sector professionals, considering methodology and salaries. And once you have the evaluation and results of these assessments, what can we do to obtain better results in sports projects? So here they focus the assessment of educators. Well, this is a very good question, especially for me, because uh, Sometimes we, uh, we talk about different aspects but forget to focus on important issues like this. In the program, Education Through Sports, we, one of our goals was to, to have students develop their potential. And we also had as a goal to contribute to, to train an educator that would see sports and act in the sports through human development. The assessments that we conducted, that which I presented the results today, I could say that the the group of professionals that today make up a very strong core I could tell you that today we have a, a, a big array of theses, theories, and uh, works of professionals that started as trainees and professors in the projects and later developed and researched different areas and today are great contributors to this knowledge that uh, initiated the program. The changes that we saw in professionals are really huge because we learn by doing, we learn by looking at an idea, ideal, consolidating beliefs and practices. So the work that we carried out uh, shows today a big body of uh, people with which we work and serve as reference today. A, a lot of trainees that started today or in the past, today are masters and professors and are working as to how to make sports a path for human development. This is very important to us. And as to education, any action that we carry out has the assumption of creating a sense to it. The solutions are not abstract. It's not an ideal that evaporates. It is something that needs to go hand in hand with people. So any proposal, action, idea that needs to be made feasible can only be feasible if shared by professionals directly involved. This, was, this happened in the program for sports and will all we also be in the programs that we are developing so that we can get to the schools. Thank you very much, Nisea. Now, the next question. This directed to you, but I want to expand and include Hezjani. 
This question was asked by Regiane Petraki from Murumbi Su University. She asks, how is the position of the Ayrton Institute towards the World Cup and the Olympic Games? I'd like to extend this question to Regiane. How do organizations that work with sports can uh, place themselves or position themselves as to the Olympic Games and the World Soccer Cup? Is there a specific mechanism of relationship, especially towards the uh, educational sports and, and non-performance sports? Well, I believe that one of the last slides said that the Institute, Ayrton Institute, is integrating the movement Athletes for Citizenship to provide a legacy for all. When the Institute accepted to participate in this uh, program, it aimed at contributing uh, to those big events. How those events, uh, what results these events should bring to a culture to favor the development of the whole potential of youngsters and uh, teenagers. So we are uh, led by this movement, Athletes for Citizenship. I'm just going to uh, deal with uh, the training of educators. I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about this. There are two social programs that are from Ministry of Sports. One is uh, Segundo Tempo Program, or Second Half, and the Sports for All. I'm going to focus on Sports uh, Leisure and Sports for the City program. We were concerned about the development of content. One of our goals was to make public uh, authorities uh, sensitive about the importance of sports and leisure as an investment to be made, and at the same time to take content uh, about uh, physical activities and sports to needy communities. So you know that, uh, for example, in the, in the case of the Amazon region, uh, do not have the centers close to communities. Uh, we wanted to have the local centers and train those uh, uh, professors and teachers there to work in the training of those agents, uh, that was our concern. There was no point in subsidizing uh, them in uh, just learning and academic learning. And we cannot do this with the person who's always worked with children and uh, then uh, turn into something different. The, the greatest challenge of the project was to put together theory and practice, and we got to a which I believe it's good, which was through the universe, Federal University of Minas Gerais, the physical education faculty, to select trainers that would have day-to-day -day experiences with communities, and not only uh, sports done at schools and not only uh, university knowledge. And this is part of our success because this uh, makes it a permanent program and also the assessment of trainers. And in this case, the universities helped us when we started to monitor and assess the uh, trainers of agents. This is a long-term process. It took us five years. So all public policies, I should say, are different from other policies, especially if compared to a private policy. And as to Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, I'm going to tell you something obvious. There are people who favor and are against the games, but for but everyone wants to get involved in the games nonetheless. The effective participation uh, working locally at uh, Rio 2016 or doing uh, surveys and research on the topic. So I can tell you what we are thinking of doing. 
all everything related to the Olympic and Paralympic Games, everything regarding the, the city, state, and the federal government, have uh, make up work groups. And there are subtopics that are worked on. For example, uh, they're talking or they're discussing security, which involves several different points. You have uh, security and the subtopics. In terms of education, we are lagging behind a little bit, mostly because we have to put all the public entities in tune and then ask other partners. So we have to establish identities at federal level and then ask for our partners. My directory is responsible for the educational legacies. There are two legacies that we're focusing. First is the requirement by the Olympic Committee, International Olympic Committee, that was uh, agreed upon when Brazil signed the, the agreement. And also the legacy, not only of the uh, the points that I mentioned, the increase of sports in uh, the, this age bracket, plus, for me, is to put together the entities that work with the sports as a whole, especially the participation sports, and this being the biggest legacy of the country. And of course, we're going to need other people involved. The moment today is to tune in the governments, local, state, and federal governments. And through this uh, uh, MOVE 2012 program, it called my attention for something which was really important. And uh, this I want to leave as a reflection. Within the historical moment we're going through, we have a lot of support and funding and a lot of uh, uh, sponsors, many people engaging banks and other institutions. So I'd like to propose that a program uh, uh, goes from 3 million people being served to 6 million. So, but after this uh, euphoria about the games is over, how to maintain those six million people in action? Who is going to foster all that? So my concern is like a deceitful uh, advertisement, so to speak, uh, like uh, those campaigns that we saw in the past that when they were over, everything finished. The sponsors went out and decided to leave and uh, uh, now we have uh, the sponsors because they know that they're going to be participating but uh, when everything's over they go to the other host countries so how will be the situation of all the students who were involved in this program. So what I ask you is to think about things that the country can really be sustainable after the Games. Thank you very much for your answer. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, I'm trying to try to compile the questions I have received in one single question for the three speakers. I'm going to start with Damien because it's something a bit more specific for him, but I'll ask the other speakers to contribute and make their final speech uh, due to time restrictions. The questions that weren't answered, we try to send them if you put your email on the question, we try to send them to you via email. So, Damien, the question is, what is the importance that InFocus gives to the adaptation of translating uh, cultural changes, taking InFocus to different countries? How do you adapt to cultural changes? And after for a question for everyone. I would like you to start answering and they will answer afterwards is how to use the uh, tools for monitoring and assessment such as the ones that were presented in small organizations uh, in regards to costs. Since small organizations do projects for sports, how can they use these monitoring and assessment tools without having uh, high costs and taking into to consideration these costs and uh, also your final remarks, please. Damien? 
Okay. So the local context is incredibly important and um, I think we operate in focus at the principal level. So the principles of monitoring and evaluation can be the same wherever we operate. Um, but it's very important that indicators um, are created locally for organizations and you know that is a creative process that um, draws from the creativity of an individual project on the ground. So we focused on ensuring that there is sufficient flexibility um, within both the software on the one hand to fully cust customize um, at the indicator level for the individual organization. Now when you measure things differently everywhere, that becomes an issue around aggregation of information. And that's one of the bigger challenges that, organiza that, that organizations who fund projects all around the world has. Um, but again, it's something that, that uh, is being tackled as a way of reporting information. So the adaptation to the local context um, I mean, that's, that's something that's vital. Um, it's something that the, uh, an organization operates in its own environment, and those environmental factors need to be brought into play. And that's the nice thing about the methodology called theory of change, because it very much focuses upon what is going on in your own environment, and where do you, as a project, sit within that environment and exert an influence. And those environments are different everywhere. So this is very much about adaptation of principles to the local context, not imposing any singular way of doing things. But there is a, you know, there becomes a challenge when you take this very local approach in terms of aggregation, but um, it's something that we're, we're also looking at in terms of I think the other question was around cost. Yes. Um, so there is uh, how we worked with... One of the great things about working in cooperation with three partners is costs come down. Um, and it's one of the fundamental um, uh, reasons for these kind of events where we collaborate and where we work together. So where there is a common goal, um, and, and impact measurement is a very common goal now, of a lot of social sector organizations. Creating a joint approach to how we do this means that the costs of implementing these sorts of solutions and, and things can be driven down. So this has been one of the, the, the great things about this project is that you know, to many of the organizations, well, to all of the organizations we've worked with, there hasn't been a cost. Um, and it's been something that's been packaged as a, either part of the funding package, et cetera. Um, but this is very much an approach which we're very keen on driving forwards now and inviting as many partners into this collaboration because um, that means that the costs of things can continue to come down um, and there's a scalability there that we can take advantage of. Um, any other questions? No, if you want to have a, your final word, your final remark, if you have any. Yeah, okay, final remark. Well, I mean, for me, this is a fundamental area, impact measurement. If we're going to get, um, get serious as a, as a sector, if you like, around sport for development, around its power, um, we have to move on from trying to convince people that sport will do stuff and sport will achieve crime reduction and health reduction and improvements here and improvements there. Um, there's a certain um, insincerity to our, our argument now uh, when we just come at it from that basis. So um, I see that this, this, the, the role and the leadership of both funders, charities, government to lead um, this process of of um, impact measurement and the changes that are required within organizations and within funders and within government to make this approach work um, is, is the fundamental ingredient um, to move 
us all forwards as a, as a collaborative so we can uh, make our case better uh, to the world. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to start? Okay. Well, actually, the, how to use the existing tools for monitoring and how to lower costs, uh, as some of what the speaker has mentioned, you have to think of these tools uh, as from the design that uh, has been done for your actions, the, indica the indicators list that is done for your process and your results in a certain way are uh, already an indication of perspectives for tools. I think that the Institute will make available uh, from every knowledge that has been produced in this sense, besides the assessments that I shared with you and that are published in the book, we have a system in, uh, in for, uh, system so that our partners can insert in this system the data from processes and is a system that can handle how we are at each stage of the process and what results are being achieved. So it is a very simple system that I think uh, if it were not for the uh, range, uh, national range of the program, I think these are mechanisms, they are practical and simple that can be developed and we could uh, share them with you as well. Uh, my l final words here, my final remarks, would be that the Institute is not an executor organ of policies. It doesn't generate policies. It has a purpose of influencing policies as a result from the work is that it's being done and these perspectives that uh, it aims for the today's society. Thank you very much. Hejani, please. If I hadn't written this down, I would doubt it. Doubt it. I'm going to follow Damien's uh, rationale. Uh, from what I understand, it would be interesting that in the public or private institution give, gave support for these more simple tools and training for implementation of these tools, especially in institutions that have all the difficulties and this would be almost a dream and almost impossible. I remember that in a, this is a good moment uh, due to uh, sports and leisure area being in evidence uh, and with all these uh, funding Perhaps uh, we, ha we could have a more technological tool. I remind you that with the time passing, uh, things become more accessible. We began with the cell phone. The cell phone used to be status, even if it were uh, it weighed two kilograms. Now everyone has a small uh, phone and has communication. So I believe technology can also assist us. Uh, I'm going to uh, Give me, give my final remarks that goes that most of us, uh, despite being a management, we think in the area because uh, that sports doesn't save everything. If we invest in ports, we're going to take uh, kids out of the streets. When I listen to this, I, I'm scared because uh, children must be in the streets to play. And during my childhood, I could play in front of my house. Uh, when I went to Belém do Pará, we had some public spaces, but uh, people would stay in front of their houses and the children would play around on the streets. And no policy, for, for example, that for, for kids to go into drugs are efficient alone. You have to generate um, 
labor, and etc. So not, let us not take sports and leisure as a savior of society, but let's do our best for what we can contribute. I have dedicated my whole professional life to public policies for sports and le leisure. I live this daily, and I believe the potential especially when we meet for in a space for uh, discussion such as this one where in the public uh, from this country or from other countries sit down and speak respectfully and with coherence thank you for your participation thank you for all three speakers i think this was a great way to end this was very optimistic we uh, are beginning to evolve and sports contributing to this as a factor and i think we were able to uh, make a deep dive in our main question how to uh, do assessment of these projects we had several insights in this beginning of the afternoon so I'd like to thank you, uh, thank our speakers. I, this was a very interesting moment, and the questions that weren't made will be handed in to the speakers. And I'd like to uh, wish you all a very good lunch and a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Agradecemos aos palestrantes Nilceia Lopes, Rejane Pena Rodrigues, Damian Hatten e a moderadora Ana Cristina Nascimento. E agora faremos um intervalo para o almoço, retomando os trabalhos às 15h30 nos espaços do teatro e auditório e pedimos a gentileza que todos levem seus pertences ao deixar o recinto. Boa tarde. Thank you. 